Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here on our final day of Intersect Aspen at the ISIS Theater for what promises to be a very engaging talk um, moderated by Josh Baer with uh, Sarah Arison and Alex Marshall. And it's called Art and the Art Market, AI Actual versus Artificial Intelligence. When this topic was discussed on some of our calls, it really fascinated me because I'm not someone who's very tech savvy. So I think this will be an interesting point of view into a conversation that we're having both in the art world and in the world in general. So we hope you enjoy the talk this morning and hope that you can come visit the fair, which is open till four in the afternoon today. Thanks again. Thank you, Becca. Thank you, Allison, Tim, from the fair. Um, we all bring different perspectives to this subject, though none of us are AI experts, which may be good, may be bad, we'll see. Alex brings a perspective from the art market, being at Christie's and being private dealer, and Sarah brings a lot of experience from the world's nonprofit education and her perspective as a collector as well. So we're going to sort of get into it in a way that we started on the phone. But first, I find it useful to understand the audience a little bit. Um, obviously, as we discussed before, you thought this was Barbie, and it's not. But how many of you are in the arts business? Okay, about half. How many of you are artists? Okay, well, we got two. And art collectors? Okay, so we have a mix, and people in finance or tech? Okay, so the people in, in finance and tech, we want you to really pay attention because you may say, that's not true, which we encourage you and we'll have plenty of time for conversation. And um, I'd like to thank Alex for actually bringing this topic about AI up. Certainly every financial proposal in the world, if, if you want to raise money, you stick the the term AI into it. So there's no proposal for anything without it. Um, so I just want to sort of start, when we're talking about, in, let's talk about intelligence first. It's like, Alex, what, what is intelligence around art and art market? What, what does that mean? Well, I think, I mean, intelligence, you know, I, it's a, ironically, it's hard to get your mind around intelligence. You know? um, was funny. <laughs> it didn't quite land, but um, I think I think of intelligence. Um, you know, I'm always attracted or drawn to people who have great intelligence, and with with at least for human intelligence, I I think of it of as having um, you know so many different kind of forms. I think of emotional intelligence. Um, lucky for me, I think of my wife when I when I say that. Um, I think of creative intelligence, which, uh, of course, in our industry is very important. Um, I think of athletic intelligence. I think of Josh Bear when I say that. Um, another <laughs> bad joke. Um, but, no, and, and I, I could go on listing different kind of intelligence that, that, that exists, but I think, uh, you know, AI, I, I think of it as exclusively as, as a tool, you know, and... Um, something that could be a disruptive technology possibly. Um, I mean, that's the promise of it, but um, I think of it more as uh, something that's just augmenting these other intelligence, these, these human intelligences that we have and um, these capacities, just like your watch, your shoes or glasses, you know, this is a um, newest form and, and, you know, obviously the most high tech form, but, uh, yeah, it's doing just that. It's augmenting the intelligence that we already have. And I think there's, from an art market perspective, there's great potential to that. And from an art making perspective, there's also a great potential to that. Well, let's come back to some of these things. I'd like to, to get Sarah sort of started. When, when you hear intelligence, AI, what comes to your mind? Um. You know, I think there's something, uh, I think there's a creativity behind intelligence, behind genuine intelligence, um, and, and an ability to 
connect a lot of different thoughts and a lot of different forms of intelligence. Um, I think some of you were at uh, Ian Chang's talk yesterday, who actually is should be sitting here instead of me because he knows a lot more about this than I do. Um, but listening to him talk and kind of following his train of thought, he, it really struck me that he's like one of the most intelligent people I've ever heard speak because he's able to connect so many different thoughts and so many different fields and kind of create new ways of thinking. Um, and, you know, with artificial intelligence, and again, I feel free to um, anybody in the audience, like, speak up, tell me I'm wrong, throw things at me because I don't, do not know what I'm talking about. But, you know, artificial intelligence seems like not genu not like genuine intelligence in that it's just scraping what has been created by individuals who are very intelligent and very creative. How about this stat? There's like four million artists in America. And I'd venture to say 3.99 million of them are intelligent. But I'm gonna have a hard time saying how many of them are really excellent artists. So intelligence is maybe like, it might be a necessary condition for making art, but not a sufficient one. So I'm not sure when we're talking about intelligence in the art making, it's that really critical in a sense. Because, I mean, do, do we know anybody who's like, makes art and you say, well, he's really, you know, not too bright. It's an interesting point. I mean, I think it, 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 it's, again, I think it comes back to this idea of like different kinds of intelligence. And I think, um, you know, knowledge is kind of maybe what you're discussing. I think in the art world, we all prize, you know, traditionally or historically, like dealers always look at the, 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 the man or woman who can, um, you know, store and, and, and pull up information, you know, in a moment as that kind of intelligence being, you know, a very useful tool in, in, in dealing paintings, especially if you can remember the year it was uh, made and the, and the year it was sold and bought and how much and how much the other ones sold for and all those kinds of things. And, but that, that, that kind of intelligence was much more important in 1976 than it's become today. Now we have these you know, you know, with we'll come back to the art market part. I want to maybe hear Sarah talk about, and especially you, you work with a lot of kids and with the public. It's like intelligence does not equal, or what m my sense of intelligence, and you're saying um, ability for creativity. I don't know that kind of one. I don't think you have to be, I guess, what would be defined as intelligent in order to be a great artist. And I don't think, I don't know that they're mutually exclusive and I don't know that kind of intelligence makes you a great artist and, and being a great artist necessarily makes you intelligent. I think there's creativity is a really Im important component of it. Um, because we're setting up this machine versus human dialogue right. and we're making this assumption about people's natural intelligence with the implication that machines may not have it around, at least around art, and I'll ask about the art market, but I think we may be overstating the human, part of the human side there. I mean, part of the human side, I think, I think the human Doing side. well on your law boards doesn't mean that you're gonna be making great paintings. We tend no, to compare no, no, your exactly. law boards with AI that they can do better on their law boards than you. Right, your SAT score isn't gonna affect the way you make a painting, but um, <laughs> I guess, you know, I think of it as a question that's often asked is, you know, who's your favorite artist? And for me, my, my favorite artist is Cy Twombly. And I think one of the things that Cy would do um, is he would pair, you know, he would often title his works after Greek mythology. And um, Greek mythology is, you know, one of the kind of the oldest Western most poetic forms of transferring information, or, you know, intelligence and collective intelligence. 
Um, and then he would pair that with this kind of very um, intuitive, instinctual, uh, childlike, you know, mark-making practice. And that kind of asymmetry has a real poetry, a real beauty to it. But I think maybe, you know, as we were talking about this and I was thinking about his work, I was, I was thinking, you know, there, I think there's a lot of wisdom and, and, and intelligence to this intuitive component, right? This, this child, this thing that we're all born with, whether that's in art making or in any kind of decision making, there's, there's intuition, there's kind of gut to everything we do. And that's, that kind of intelligence, I think, is very important to artists because a lot of that creates, that's where mistakes are made. And I think mistakes are where great art is made, oftentimes, not always. But I think that out of mistakes can grow a lot of great art. I also think that, you know, artists so so frequently and why I think they're so important to us, they reflect what's going on in the world around us. And I, if you look at so many artists and their practices, you know, their, some of their greatest work will often come out of a time when you know, our world is going through a really difficult you know, really difficult time. They're responding to something that's going on in, in our society. They're responding to something that's going on in their own lives that might be really difficult. And that that is, ends up being a force for, for creativity and really pushing them to, um, to push their own practice. And, you know, that's certainly not something that artificial intelligence um, is, is capable of. I think at this point it might be good to step back a little bit about not everybody's on the same level about what is artificial intelligence and have you been using it. So it's a field that started formally in 1956 and as truth be told I studied it in grad school in the 70s. Did you really? Yeah, and it's in my <laughs> master's program in computer science I studied artificial intelligence and it made very little advances from the 50s when it was mostly trying to mimic language till maybe um, 10 years ago, because anybody know the artificial intelligence experiences that all of us use every day? For instance, anybody have something that's not a robot, that's really AI, that I bet everybody in this room uses almost every day? Google, for instance. Google's AI. Right. Amazon is AI. YouTube, AI. So the ability for those kinds of applications really, you know, this AI talk that's in the last year, it's really started to accelerate because of those kinds of, of things. So it's kind of like we actually know a lot more about it than we realize. And you know a lot more about it than we realized. <laughs> you studied it. Not prepare college. us. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know we were with an expert. I thought yeah. we were all on the same level, but I guess you have. Uh... <laughs> See, it's like most people think just another pretty face, but no. Degree in mathematics, very aesthetic, mind you. Masters in computer science, not very aesthetic. And the other thing that I think is relevant in that sort of understanding about what AI is, it's all zeros and ones, okay? Computers are zeros and ones. Everything it does, it's either a zero or it's a one. Those microchips are billions of zeros and ones, but I don't think our brains work as zeros and ones. And the comparison that we'll get to is, how does this work against these machines? And AI is really, well, when we're talking about it, now we're really talking about deep learning, I think is the best way to think about it as a term. It's like, you know, you're on your iPhone, that's a smart machine, that's AI. But Siri is part of that, language recognition is there, all those things that we're dealing with. So how does deep learning work for like art making? Have you, have you seen works made by smart machines? We have the Rafik Anadol up at MoMA now, which, I mean, I, I think it's really interesting. I think audiences are responding really well to it. Um, you know, Ian Chang's Bob, I think, is is one of the, the best examples there is, and kind of watching the evolution of that project has been very, very interesting. You know, um, 
you know, name drop here a little bit, but um, Jordan Wolfson was showing me recently his his uh, newest animatronic sculpture, um, um, body sculpture, which is actually premiering in Australia in December. And I'm not going to go too much into it, but it's incredible, and everybody should go go check it out. It's a third iteration or third. Um, animatronic he's made uh 10 years after he made female figure which i think is one of the you know most important and and impressive uh works of the 21st century um but he was showing it to us uh to a few friends and and and, and some of these friends were were music producers and worked in the music industry and um you know jordan talked about how he uh used ai at different parts of, uh, or he tried to use AI different parts of the kind of configuration of the, of, of the performance of the sculpture. Um, and it led to a discussion about how in music they use AI regularly. And, um, you know, I think we're all kind of familiar with Dali in the art world, uh, this kind of, uh, picture generating, um, technology or, you know, chat GPT um, for large language models that that kind of produce, you know, everybody's, you know, uh, Alex Israel saw him last night. He said his his press release was made by chat GPT. Um, But these uh, music guys, it was really interesting that they they say that, that, you know, they're they're quite successful producers and they use it immensely. And then they they, they mentioned somebody who I, I had no idea about this this artist named David, D4VD. I'm, I'm sure you all know who, who he is. But da- David... Um, go, go buy two right now. Yeah. Da- David um, he was a streamer on... He was a gamer. And he uh, kept getting his videos taken down um, because, uh, you know, YouTube had copyright infringements for his, his music. Um, and... So he went online and Googled how to make music. And it turns out you he has an AI machine that makes the soundtrack. He has an AI write the lyrics. And on his phone, he is recording m- th- these songs. Um, you know, he has 600 million streams and he has a top 40 song and he's like super successful. I mean, these guys are talking about how they brought up a really good point, and I think we talked about it a little bit earlier. Was um, he is like a high level prompter of of these AI, right? He's he's able to prompt it in a certain way that allows for him to to be able to make these kind of great art. Um, I think you know, like a piano, every, anybody can go and you know hit, hit hit the keyboards, but we're not all Mozart. Sarah, would you collect this work? Are you buying everybody's? I mean, NFTs is so, oh, that's so 2021. <laughs> right, like that. You probably, and we were kidding about, you know, that you went all in at Bitcoin at 65,000, you know, the kids, college tuitions, all that. Where are you as as a collector with on all this? Because you mentioned an artist who's been working in this area for, I don't know, 20 years, pretty much. You know, I, I think I'm probably the, um, wrong person to be a collector for this work uh, because you know I would I would say that 90 to 95 percent of the work that I own I know the artists well and have worked with them in some capacity and for me that is actually really what I enjoy about the art world is getting to know the artists um, you know really getting to spend time with them getting to um, understand their work, you know, watch the trajectory of their work uh, through an organization I chair, Young Arts. I meet a lot of artists across disciplines um, when they're 15 to 18 years old, when they're in high school. And I love meeting them at that really critical juncture in their lives when they're kind of figuring out what to do for their education and career, um, helping them to to figure that out and then following, you know, maybe their, their first group show and then their first solo show. And I, the the personal component 
um, of art is actually what I think is most exciting and interesting to me. And really getting to know um, artists and, and, and these wonderful communities. And so I don't know that I am necessarily the right person. <laughs> but I, I, I think feel like Alex does, that it's all a tool in yeah. the same way as drawing is. And most people would say, okay, it's a bit of a tool, right? Mm -hmm. So, but there's people who don't believe that. So, how many people here know the, the, the concept of being sentient as opposed around that? Okay. Well, that's so, a, that's a, that's a, that's so a it, different it, panel, I feel like. No, it's the same thing because it's like, yeah. where is artificial really going? Right. The people involved in it think it can take on all the things you said that were human. The emotion, consciousness, that these machines can become and will replace us as human beings. This guy left Google with that. I was talking to somebody in the gaming business from Aspen yesterday, and she believes that it is sentient. Right. And that's, you know, is that possible? Where do you feel that could be like on the horizon? I I'd like you're 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 the expert. Um, <laughs> but I think uh, you know, I think what you're talking about is AGI, right? This, um, what they call AGI, it's a, you know, artificial general intelligence, this kind of super intelligence. Uh, it's like Ray Kurzweil's idea of uh, singularity. I don't know if you've seen that, that documentary. It's incredible. But um, it's not reality. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a potential of the future, and that's really cool, another thing that we can talk about. But I think right now we have this really powerful machine, this really powerful tool that we already, I think, will in itself create a lot of disruption and changes to, if you think about just how, you know, in, in the art market, obviously, from my perspective, like the, the JPEG and the internet, how much that changed the art market in the last 20 years. Um, you know, this, this tool, uh, as they develop, I think is going to be really impactful. And I, I don't think we need to go as far as thinking, well, we've built this alien, uh, God <laughs> to like, you know, I think that's like another, I, I think that's another layer. I personally don't, um, agree with that idea. I think, I think, I think it seems, if we're not asking the questions now, though, you have to be careful it's not too late. And there are major issues going on with these things. And as we head to regulation, which is coming, I see somebody who said they know tech sort of nodding. We're, we are at a critical junction here of discussing these things. That's why it was kind of interesting for us being not experts. How, how's sense. the metaverse going? Is that going well? Because I've heard a lot of, <laughs> I've heard a lot of things about from the. the well, my buddy Elon's having a little bit of a problem. But. You no, know, look, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not supposing like I know more than any of those people, Elon especially. But I, I'm just. I, I guess I'm just doubtful. I think. I think it's. I think it, there is a bit of a cult of like this information, and I think, in all groups of, uh, you know, and I started. Way in, then I'll come back to the art market for a sec. Do what? Oh, yeah, I, I think we are at such an early stage of understanding the implications of even just what we have right now. Um, and, and you're just kind of starting to see the effects, you know, the writer strike. Um, and and we are, I think we, we can't even kind of begin to imagine the the ripple effect and kind of the um, almost like the butterfly effect of of the implications of this, but you know we're I think the vast majority of us are at very early stages, and I do think it's important to kind of start to to think about and discuss you know the implications and um, impacts that it will have on people's jobs. And um, but but I do think that we have a very very long way to go um, in in understanding it and in utilizing it um, kind of in, a, in an effective way. Alex, where's, what's its effect gonna be on the art market? Something I don't know much about. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
for the auction business, it's going to be amazing. Um, Christie's is going to boom for the next. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't. I don't. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I, you mean I, when your job becomes obsolete, <laughs> doing appraisals? Yeah. I mean, I would say the same you thing know. about intelligence applied to making art. Is a lot of smart people doesn't mean that they collect art in a way that's really that good or that financially valuable. There's no quant fund for art that I know of and no good way to short art that I know of, I wish there were. And it's like, is it something that your industry or the museums are thinking this is gonna change how we function? Well, I think already us? like, you, you know, we mentioned, Sarah mentioned is, you know, with the Rafik sculpture, that's already kind of changing this, this idea of experiential art was, it's not a new idea, but it is, a certainly a more pronounced idea today than it was uh, again like 1976 i don't know why i'm using that date but um i do think uh from the art market perspective i think i i see it more in terms of like the menial kind of everyday uh tasks could could, could end up being usurped by ai but um does it you know, you know i think i think it's going to Look, we're going to be walking around with uh, a machine in our pocket or whatever, strapped to our head or however, uh, plugged into the back of our necks. Yeah. Um, however, it comes, at, but 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 it's going to have you know two hundred level IQ, and you know if right now you're you're thinking, you know I can't Various remember something. Might have a two thousand <laughs> level IQ, and that's what people are saying. It's like right, right. right. Well, even the implications of a two, you know, one hundred and forty level. Say <laughs> it would be a that's not the top of your range. <laughs> so, in the museums and in your foundation work and working with kids, that's a whole other generation. Where do they see it? Well, so you know, it's interesting. I think um, Lori Anderson, who's been like experimenting with this, was just named the artist in residence at the um, Australian Institute for Machine Learning. Um, you know, what what does that mean? What does that role mean? Um, and it, and does that mean that there actually is going to be more kind of collaboration um, be, between artists and, and technology? I think, you know, it's interesting um, with Young Arts, we get around 8,000 applications from high school students a year across disciplines. And something that we um, are, dis there are kind of two things that we're really um, discussing that are, I think, are major issues, not just for us, but for universities as well or, you know, um, competitions for, for fellowships or internships. Um, one is, you know, is this work um, really coming from the applicant, or is it something that they, that is, you know, augmented by technology in, in some respect? And that could actually be across disciplines. So, you know, with voice, they have technology that as as you are singing, it can adjust the, the pitch and the tune. And so you know, we get we get these applications and what happens if the voice that you're hearing in the application, the winner then arrives and it's a completely different voice that's actually not very good at all. What if the writing sample was generated by AI? What if, you know, the, the visual art, like the, there is um, I think something that needs to be addressed when, you, when you're kind of getting applications in, in all of these different art forms um, of what, you know, what is the work of the student. Um, My daughter's college application, she's got to write it herself now. <laughs> yes. Shit. Oh, man. I think, I think, I think it, it kind of tears it. Because uh, kids hard. are doing it then. Right. But it kind of, it, 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 it points to, to one of the, one of the big issues in the art world, the authenticity and, um, you know, Warhol probably being the uh, the biggest voice in that. You know, even recently there was a Supreme Court ruling that that uh, you know for his portrait of of of, of Prince. Prince, the artist formerly known as Prince, um, he uh, had copyright. You know, there, there was a decision about the copyright legalities, but you know, so it's 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 an issue that's been kind of already. Um, mined by artists, and I think it's something that's actually become uh, even more. Important. I was thinking about this last night about the emotional, the sublime, all these characteristics that we say and think about Twombly and art that we love and the machine can too. And then I started to talk about, think about Richter, because Richter, 
basically says, I can separate that completely out. I can be machine-like, no emotion, remove my consciousness from it. And we think of him as one of the great champions of beauty in the world. So we tend to think, oh, we're all on this sort of like sublime rothko side, but maybe things are more blended already than we think. And I think we are at a critical junction. Um, if you don't mind, maybe we, we can have a few questions if there are some. We, we went a lot of different directions. They are all over the place. I think we might have a mic someplace if somebody has a question before. I'm actually going to call out my friend Jenna Siegel. <laughs> Yes. 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 Beca because Jenna just did a phenomenal show a couple of months ago in New York called Twenty One Women, and the catalog was written by AI, and then was edited um, by a human being. And so, can you just talk a little bit about kind of that process and and how you experienced it? And yeah, sorry. <laughs> you owe her big time. You are so mean. <laughs> um. Thank you for, for asking. Really interesting, Thank and I you. think it was something that was so applicable to the field, and is that something that is now going to become, you know, a much more common practice? So I have a really interesting experience in that I have a 17-year-old, a 15-year-old, and a 13-year-old. My 17-year-old has been coding AI since he was 10, just kind of took to it immediately and learned how to do it. My 15-year-old is an artist, and she is viciously opposed to AI, won't even... Like, she feels like she's cheating if she plays around with it. So, and I'm trying to make her experience it a little. Um, so, 31 Women was uh, Peggy Guggenheim's um, exhibition, uh, first all female exhibition in the United States um, in 1943. I've been fascinated with it. I started collecting the 31 artists. And then, when I got to the point where I had research, but I knew that if I had to hire a writer, to write the catalog for me, I would be another three years before I could do anything with the research. I decided to spend some time on ChatGPT. I learned very quickly that it's amazing in the beginning, but you really need to learn how to become an editor because there's stuff that's not true that can be put in or it'll change. While the language sounds beautiful, it's not accurately portraying what you're trying to portray. So, so you have I, to fact check it. So you have to fact check. So I tell all the college students that I meet now who are, are graduating from Tisch with degrees in writing um, to make sure to spend time on chat GPT and on their resumes, put AI editor as a skill. Because being able to read through AI and be a good enough writer to reconstruct and rewrite and also to give the inputs to AI or to a chat GPT or something like that for what you're actually looking for or what you want to convey is going to be the essential skill set um, for, uh, I think, for the future of, of industry and art writing, et cetera. Do you have a question for Sarah? I have so many questions for Sarah, but I'm not going to share them here. <laughs> I tried to help you. Thanks. Other questions, comments? Hi, um, I'd just love if each of you might share your own opinion about what makes art good. I know there, that's a big subject, but it feels like if we walk into a room and there's a piece of art that we respond to in some way and just feels like a really great piece of art, I wonder if it will matter who or what made it. Well, you used two very different words there, and that's really important. You started with good, and then you went to great. <laughs> Okay, and that's one of the first things I always talk to people about is in finance, great is the enemy of good. When you're investing, Steve Cohen, the world's greatest trader, he's right 55% of the time, okay? If you collect art and you know, you're lucky if you're right 5% of the time. But the great does, collectors. But what does right mean? Right means that history will recognize it if you're collecting things that you like versus things you love, that's a sense of right and wrong. Don't buy things you like, buy things you love. Don't care about things that are good, care about things that are great. So that's, an intu that's just my general thing, and based on your question, I think you... 
but different. You know, you're at Christie's, you always sell like 600,000 things a year. Yeah, I don't, all the art is great. Um, we don't discriminate, no. Um, I think what makes a great artwork, I guess, yeah, I guess that's, a, that's such a personal and, um, you know, like like earlier I said, Cy Twombly is my, my favorite artist. I didn't say he's the greatest artist. And, and I think the difference is, you know, there's some artists have more, um, you know, bigger influence or more impact on the generations that follow them. And some artists are... Um, you know, more poignant to the the moment. You know, and you made a great point earlier, though. Well, I'm trying me, to make another one. Good versus great. <laughs> no, but let me. It's when you're talking about mistakes, and like you, if you look at Rauschenberg versus Johns, Rauschenberg made a lot more mistakes. You look at Polka versus Richter. Polka made a lot more mistakes. Both of them, in my mind, were better artists in there. So your question before, and now you can go back to your thing, was really exceptional, the point about mistakes being relevant for art making. So it's Thank flattering. Thank you for, for telling me how <laughs> um, exceptional my, my point was, and I agree. Um, but I, 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 guess, I, I, guess, I guess the point was that we often, um, that, that, that measure of what is great is constantly changing. And, um, you know, I guess, when he says, you know, you know, things that will last, I think what he's saying is that, like, if it remains in the zeitgeist, if it remains as a point of reference um, long after its moment, I, that's very difficult for anything to kind of elevate in, in culture. Um, and, and that might be like, there's different levels of greatness, but that might be the highest level of greatness. You know, I think if you look back at, you know, the history of art, you know, every century only has maybe 20 artists that you, that you, you know, you, you can, you can talk about as, as the further you get away from it, it becomes maybe less, you know? So it's, it's, it's difficult to be great. Sarah. I, I you know, as you may have uh, been able to tell from what I've said before, I, I, there's a very personal approach to it for me. And I think what you said about just responding to something is really important. Um, I can't tell you the number of times somebody's come up to me and they're like, okay, so what should I buy now that's gonna like, you know, increase in value? I'm like, just don't. I mean, if that's if that's why you want to get into the art world, go do something else. Um, go, buy, go buy a poster and stick it on your wall. Um, but, but I do think that there is something really to be said about that emotional response. And, you know, is it speaking to you and is it speaking to you, you know, in a certain moment of your life and it's in a certain time in the world? Um, I, I take a very personal approach to, you know, what, um, what somebody might think is great art and what they want to live with. And I think wanting to live with something, um, you know, for me, that means it's great. If you want to see it every day when you wake up, I think that's great. No. Okay. Are we gonna is 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 AI leading us towards like a non-human creator? Like you know, at Baldwin Gallery, there are these amazing paintings by Inga Essenhigh, and that is sentient. You know, that is like a human artist having an experience with her drawing and her color and how she sees the universe. Are, is AI going to like create these Incas? Well, like that's why I brought Richter up because Richter is arguing, like I can do anything. I can make a landscape. I can make an abstract. I can make a portrait. I can do all these things that you that deal with beauty, not in the way that you think they are. So I think the question is sort of where's the future? Where are we going? I think, you and know, that, chess, chess that's, in chess, not that, you know, we're grandmasters over here or anything, but in chess, the best chess players are AI, you know, and we don't watch chess, uh, if you do watch chess, um, AI versus AI. You watch humans play AI, uh, chess, and they use, you know, the technologies and to learn different moves and, you know, techniques or whatever, you know, but but they're not... In the end, we are attracted to the human experience. And I think, you know, we can prompt, we can, you know, we can, uh, we can manipulate the technology. And I think, but I think in the end, 
it's always coming from us, right? This is not a technology that exists independent of us. It comes from us. And I think at the, the root of it is this idea like AI versus human intelligence, when in reality, almost every technology I can think of is, 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 is just, it ends up being a part of us. You know, it's not, it's not exactly like we're not. Like we're, we're, we are the agency behind it. It's not right. like they have independent agency. Yeah, you might hit your car sometimes when it's not like doing the right thing, but you, you, you know, it's it, at the end of the day, it's not against you. Well, I think it's like I like to drive my car. It's fun. I wish everybody else was in self-driving cars because it'd be safer for me. So it's like, how are we going to deal with the mistakes of like one person killed by a Google driving car? versus 40,000 people killed by drunk drivers. So the future is gonna be judged again by regulation and by things outside our control. Yeah, I mean control is interesting too because who controls? Hi, um, so last week I was interviewed by a really precocious um, high school student about AI. And she kept going to, but AI can make beautiful art. AI can make more beautiful art. So we ended up right where you are right now. AI can make art, but is it great art? So my question to you, the three of you, do you know or have you talked to artists who can maybe predict what attributes in AI could produce that great art? You're dealing with young people. Like, if you're treating AI as a tool. So it's interesting because you're saying that this high school student was that it can make beautiful art. But I, I don't think that all art that is great is necessarily beautiful. Exactly. I mean, some, of, some of it's very difficult, but it's still great. So, and again, I think it has so much to do with responding to, the, like, what's going on in the world around the artist and the life of the artist. And so I think using the term beauty to define great art isn't necessarily... Um, the right way to to uh, to think about it definitely but what what as a tool if we treat ai as a tool so like if it were a pencil or a paintbrush what attributes do you think are more promising in ai to create great art i think i think it's a i think if we th were thinking in the terms of painting it's it's a it gets more complicated for us to kind of conceptualize. I think when we talk about music, yeah. it, it gets a little bit easier to, to understand because it's a little bit more, we're closer to that. Um, I, I don't, I think, I think again, it's like what makes for the, what, what intuitive and, and, you know, creative spirit makes for the painter that can make the great painting, what makes for the great musician who can make the great you know, music using this technology, it's, it's, it's to be seen. And it's, uh, I think it's, it's kind of what's really exciting about the technology. And I think it's also, and, and one of the things I was going to talk about when, when thinking about the young arts application is how are artistic disciplines developing? So, you know, for example, um, when Young Arts was founded in 1981, the dance disciplines were, you know, classical ballet, tap, and modern. Um, we started receiving applications in hip hop, and we we started seeing that really being a developing discipline. And now it's it's a strong dance discipline. What are the artistic disciplines that are going to become? Um, you know, the disciplines of the future that I think are not traditional disciplines right now. You know, is is working with AI going to become an artistic discipline in and of itself? And in that case, we have to kind of figure out who is going to be the adjudicator for that and how it's going to be adjudicated. So that's a whole nother way of thinking of, is there going to be a discipline of working with AI? Shout out uh, Christie's digital art team. <laughs> you want to be an adjudicator? Um, no, but we, that is like kind of like the, the field that has first come to um, fruition with, with, with this technology. And they're, they're the ones who are kind of leading the way. But I don't think, um, I think that's in a very kind of more literal sense. Or, or it's, more it's still back to good versus great. AI is winning jury shows, okay? But the level of competition is modest or good. 
So AI can make good stuff. It's like, but can it make what we're calling great? Intuitively, as human beings, we choose to believe no. And I think that's part of our self-identity, how we want to look at each other. And it's how we look at each other. It's like, is that a, is that a great person? Is that a beautiful person? Those are kind of chemical kinds of things that that we have as human beings. So I think we all are hoping that the human spirit is allowed to go. Jenna? Oh, wait, there's a, oh sorry, there's a Are you measuring? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. You're you're a tech person, right? Um, yes. So help. <laughs> you're still here, so that's good. Indeed. Um, autonomy of decision making is really the tipping point that we're discussing in terms of AI. In the arts and culture field, who do you think should be the strategists or leaders that kind of police where those boundaries fall? Is it the legal system? Is it museums and galleries? Or is it artists themselves? Well, the legal system always gets it wrong about art. They're always on the wrong side of every single case. OK? So I, I hope it's not the legal system. I would, even though I would hope it's not the market. Well, it was interesting that the um, Warhol case you were talking about, there were two dissenting opinions. And I think one of, one of the judges wrote, you guys just do not understand the art world, <laughs> which I think, like in the actual legal decision. So, so yes, I think you're right there. But I think you phrased that really in a helpful way about you know, the autonomy of it, then that's like, we should write that word down. Use that one. Yeah. So, Christie's digital. Okay. Right. Do you have another? Uh, behind you, that was the finance guy. Yeah. Should, should we call art generated or held by AI just fake art? Fake art, is that what you said? Yeah, fake art. Just fake art. <laughs> yeah, fake, fake art. That is fake, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think there's different. Uh, there's a difference in you know having ChatGPT write your college essay, and then presenting it as your own work, versus an artist who is who is um, using a tool to create a work. I, I I think there's a I think there's a distinction there. When when we have this issue. It's a misnomer. I mean, as a kid, I don't know how many of you know the painter Joe Bear, my mother. She made these white paintings, OK? So as a kid, I'd get humiliated by your mother makes these paintings that are all white. That's not art. Fake okay? art. It's, fake and, art. and I didn't quite come up with fake art. But I think the term that is it's like it's not as good or it's bad. That would be bad art. Art, the only way you can really define art is if the, if the person making it intends it to be art. That's really the only definition. Everything else is like, they, they meant it to be art, it's just bad, okay? But you, fake it doesn't really exist in art except for really trying to make forgeries. That's fake. There's no such thing as fake art. It's either art or not art. Sorry, I was just wondering if, Sarah, what you're differentiating is if people are asking the question of what makes great art being something that has great value as a result, financial financial value. Because yeah. I right. think that's a, like a lot of people are interested in the financial right. side of things. And so that's why I'm curious to your question over here. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but um, whether... I, I see AI as something that helps give kids some equality, level of equality. Like even when we're talking about college essays, there are kids who aren't able to write as well. But they can write the original prompts of what they want to relay in a college essay and run it through AI to help convey what they're, they're trying to say. And that could be a really important perspective. And they don't have any of the other human tools that you'd have to pay for in economically better supported areas. And I think it's the same with art um, in terms of great art. Or it, I think it depends on 
what you're willing to spend on it, but if somebody has something in their head that they don't have the tools to make themselves, but they're able to have the tool of AI to help them use it to create what they want to create, how do we say, no, that's not art because you couldn't afford the brush and the lessons and the paint to do it? Right, or David making his top 40 song on, on his phone instead of in a booth with like, you know, a whole team and or an orchestra or whatever, you know, it, it, it always, um, I think, uh, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't subscribe to the idea of fake. Um, I actually really like fake art. Like famous fake art is maybe the best is, Give you know, an example. well, I don't want to go too, too much into it, but, but there, there's actually, you know, um, the Boyman's Museum had this, uh, this, I think it was like a Rembrandt um, that was uh, a famous fake. Um, it was something in World War II where this uh, dealer uh, was arrested. Um, and he, uh, after World War II, he was arrested. And he was, he was, he was accused of, of conspiring with the Nazis to make them money. He was stealing from the Jews and, and selling the paintings. And he said, no, 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 no. I didn't sell, I didn't, I didn't actually, I was not with the Nazis. Huh? I was with, the, I was with the Jews. Actually, I was making uh, these paintings. I was making forgeries and I was selling um, these fakes to the Nazis and I was duping them really, you know? And, and then in the courtroom, he was asked to then recreate one of these paintings and he, um, he did and, 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 and he was acquitted. Um, and then later they found out actually, no, he was totally a Nazi. And, uh, <laughs> but, um, that painting then existed at the Boymans or had been donated at some point to the Boymans. And, and then there was a show in Boston that traveled, I think to Florida a few years ago, you know, five or so years ago. And, um, my friend Francesco Soki is a curator of the Boymans had to fly with the fake painting. They often fly with the paintings to like escort high value works, but I thought it was amazing. He's flying with a fake painting to Boston to have this show of fake paintings. And um, that's, I think it's great. I think that's, that's By the way, we, you probably noticed we're filming this. You've all signed your waiver. Oh, yeah. I didn't sign. I didn't sign. Well. I, I, I signed for you. Uh, <laughs> I, faked. Faked it. You faked it. I faked your signature. Yeah. Um, I appreciate this so much because I feel like we're, we have more questions than answers. And we're, it's not a question of when or if, it's now. So we are living in a time in which AI is here. Um, so I feel like I'm in the hot seat. I feel like we're all in the hot seat with what is happening. But I wanted to ask, actually, like Sarah to Jen, I wanted to ask um, an artist, at least one in the room, um, Maz Christensen, who's a light artist working in that digital space, who has a piece that's at Intersect working with AI. Um, what are you discovering with the piece that you have? Since you're sort of like what you said, Sarah and Jen, about the prompt, the quality of the prompt, which is the human interacting with the machine. So I just thought that might be interesting for us all Absolutely. with the piece. Well, I think if you're looking for fact, facts, you have to fact check, like someone said. Um, yeah, so if you ask it for a list of words, which I did for the piece that I created, unique words, it was not a list of unique words. They were not technically unique. If you sorted it, you would find duplicates. And I kept them in there because, you know, that's, that's what came out. So I, and I think another important thing is uh, what you said earlier is um, happy accidents. I think those are maybe more interesting. You ask it for something, and it pops out something that you didn't expect based on your prompt, uh, especially with images. I think it's really interesting. Something odd comes out, and I think that is, you know, that happens when we create with any tool, I think, if it's Photoshop or if it's a brush. So, let me ask you a question. As, as a child of, like, 
and I know some other curators here have this experience of, of the pictures generation. The, the idea was we didn't need any new images. Every image had already been done. So now we keep talking, we have sort of going into originality questions and authenticity. Right. But 40 years ago, 50 years ago, we had the exact opposite discussion. Is that in your mind? Well, I think it's really interesting, the regurgitation problem, in a sense, with AI now is that it's everything that we get out of these systems is based on prior art, right? So it's really like the big inspiration machine, in a sense. Um, and then what comes out of that that is actually truly original? But I think artists have always remixed other artists' work and be, been in, uh, inspired by other artists. And I think maybe this is just like maybe an acceleration of it, like a fast tracking of inspiration. Good artists borrow, great artists steal. I think. Yeah, is that... Picasso. I think right. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that as aspect as well. And I think it's it's. I think that's always been the thing with technology. Is it in the beginning? It's always mechanical. And then people start teasing out, you know, it's no longer a tool, it's a um, creative extension of yourself. It's not just a hammer, it, you know, it does something special in, in the hands of people who have worked with it and who have somehow figured out how to use it. Yeah, like I asked uh, ChatGPT to tell me a joke, um, and, and then funny? I asked it to tell me another one, and then another. And it never told me a good joke. So, you know, <laughs> I do think the prompting is important. Yeah. But I think that was interesting. The hallucinations are interesting, right? Because that's all the, the crisscrossing of information and, in a sense, incorrect, um, uh, incorrect, making incorrect connections between information. And then out of that comes something possibly interesting or possibly not funny. But, you know... <laughs> That's a great point. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Who's got the best question? I have a question. I'll let y'all judge whether or not it's the best. So let's assume that sometime in the next X years, there's a sentient AI. Now, how are we going to judge sentiments, right? Let's assume this thing starts creating art, right? Because many artists are artists just because they can't be anything else. They have to create their art. The art's within them. They have to express it. So the sentient AI creates art. But it looks like a drawing that perhaps if you gave a, a dolphin or an elephant a toothbrush, right? Not a toothbrush, sorry, a paintbrush. So you've all probably all seen those, the art. You give the dolphin a paintbrush, and it draws on the canvas. And it looks like paint, but it was created by a dolphin. Amazing, right? But now this is created by a, a sentient AI. First one ever. Is that collectible? I put that to the panel. The most important question, can you make money off of it? Um, <laughs> no, I, I mean, everything's collectible. You know? um, we, we have many departments at Christie's. Um, <laughs> I, 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 but I think you, you bring up a good point. You know, like it's, it's, uh, there, there, there is like, there does seem to be this kind of um, promise of, like somehow AI will turn into this other thing, right? This this um, this super being, and then that super being, you know, it, maybe it'll make great paintings, and you know that that that'll be that'll be a fun thing to see also. But I I, I think uh, I think where we're at today, we're still like again trying to just grapple with the complexities of this technology. Anything that somebody will buy is collectible, I think. You know, so if somebody's going to buy it, it's collectible. I think your question is, and the point was made, if the machine can only look backwards, that's a limitation, right? So the human around art can look backwards, can feel its moment, can feel each other, but also in a way that can look f to the future of things, and that might be the limitation there. Can, can something sentient look forward to the future? And that'll become a question that's still unresolved. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Josh. <laughs>